have to say, we certainly know that there are a number of you that uh, would fulfill the criteria for receiving this award. I'm now delighted to present this year's winner. Welcome up to stage, Professor David C. Medal 2018, a medal of pure good. <laughs> <laughs> and you will tell us about the essence of research in Eurotology. Thank you again. Uh, this is a great privilege and an honor. At the outset, I want to say I'm really accepting this on the behalf of the Neurotology Group at Johns Hopkins, because virtually everyone in our department has contributed to this. So uh, I'm going to talk about magnetic field vestibular stimulation. It's a new form of labyrinthine stimulation, and uh, its application to something we'll call set point adaptation. What's the problem? The problem is, how does the brain restore and maintain static balance to eliminate nystagmus and preserve vision after, for example, a unilateral vestibular loss? And before beginning our journey, I think it's always important to, to pay homage to those who came before. Uh, for those of you who occasionally go to Google, Google Scholar, you will see this, uh, <coughs> this um, uh, statement, stand on the shoulders of giants, and we sometimes attribute this to Isaac Newton. And if we want to go back a few thousand years, we can look back at mythology and look at the giant Orion who was blind and his servant Sedalian who's served as Orion's eyes. In our lab, it's this guy, Dale Roberts, who serves as Giant's eyes. So uh, it really should be stand on the shoulders of Giants from, from different disciplines. And in terms of our work, it's been a combination of neuroscience and physiology, medicine and rehabilitation, and physics and biomedical engineering. And we needed expertise from all the, these areas to put the story together of what is and what can be done with magnetic vestibular stimulation. Uh, we should look at the masters who were born in the 19th century. There was, of course, Tesla and Lorenz who taught us so much about magnetic fields. Then there were the great vestibular physiologists who taught us how the labyrinth was organized. Ewald, Florenz, and Breuer. And of course, I'll get to this later, we'll talk about those physiologists who brought to our minds a homeostasis, equilibrium, static balance, Walter Cannon and uh, Claude Bernard. And then there's our man, Robert Barney, who uh, did so much. Uh, he, of course, brought us the caloric test, he began to use the chair test practically. He taught us about benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. He taught us about the orientation of the labyrinth. And these are the masters of the 21st century. Uh, these are the people who work with us on our research in this area. Dale Roberts, Jorge Otero Milan, Prem Jaris and Tassin, Brian Ward, Michael Schubert, John Kerry, Charles Della Santina, all major contributors to this work. So I'm going to give you a brief glance at the conclusions, so you maybe will follow what I'm, I'm going to say. Vestibular set point, or bias adaptation, rebalances the vestibular nuclei over multiple time courses 
to eliminate unwanted spontaneous nystagmus. We use magnetic vestibular stimulation, or MVS, which is the ideal tool to dissect out the first three time courses of adaptation over seconds, minutes, and hours. And each adaptive stage is characterized by progressively increasing time for acquisition, but with increasing time of retention. Slower, but more long-lasting learning. So, a little roadmap for today. We're going to start out by explaining to you what is magnetic vestibular stimulation. This all began with a conversation in Siena, Italy, a favorite haunt of mine. Uh, I was talking to an otolaryngologist, uh, Vincenzo Marcelli, there about uh, almost nine years ago now, and he told me that he had observed some spontaneous nystagmus in patients who were lying in a magnetic before they put in any water in their ears to induce a caloric nystagmus. I became quite excited about this. There were lots of ideas about what this might be uh, caused by. And Marcelli himself speculated at that time that maybe the magnetic field is doing something to the labyrinth. Well, we went back to Johns Hopkins, where we have a seven Tesla magnet to explore this problem. And a, a, an MRI machine is nothing more than a big magnet, an expensive magnet. And we were able to use this to try and understand what was going on in these patients who were getting dizzy and getting nystagmus in a strong MRI machine. So let me tell you our train of thought. Um, it was actually known for years that people were getting dizzy in and around strong magnets. For 20 years this had been reported by technicians. And if you ask any of your technicians who are working around three Tesla MRI scans, they will tell you that they will occasionally can detect a little dizziness when they're moving or in near the scanner. The first key in solving this problem was something we all neurotologists do. We eliminate fixation to bring out a peripheral vestibular nystagmus by using, in our case, infrared video goggles so we could actually eliminate fixation in the scanner. Fixation mechanisms use unwanted motion of images across the retina as the air signal to trigger a corrective response to stabilize images on the retina. Fixation is the first line of defense against unwanted eye movements. And as we all know, the hallmark clinical dictum of uh, <coughs> peripheral vestibular nystagmus is suppressed by fixation. This is the Romberg sign of the vestibular ocular reflex. So we put patients normal subjects, I should say, in the magnet and recorded the nystagmus that they might generate. Uh, we're not taking any images. This is just using the MRI machine as a magnet. So if we can try this video, please. <laughs> so uh, this is a subject who's in the audience. Um, <laughs> Privacy doesn't allow me to tell you who it is. Um, there's a little bit of nystagmus even when the subject is outside the bore because this is such a strong magnet. Now we're into the bore of a 7T uh, magnet and this is a roaring nystagmus. And there's a perception of vertigo with this nystagmus. And this is gonna go on and on and on. We've done it for long periods of time. You'll see more than an hour. And uh, this nystagmus will persist, albeit adapt a little bit. So uh, that's uh, a good example. Everybody, every normal person who doesn't have labyrinthine disease or, or has labyrinthine function will develop nystagmus. If you put them in a seven Tesla magnet, you may have to adjust the orientation of the head a little bit. But this is a pervasive, ubiquitous phenomenon. So just a, a simple review of what, to help us understand what might be happening here. So uh, how do we sense head rotation? Well, there's fluid flow, the cupula moves, hair cells bend, there's a change in neural discharge. The canals respond to acceleration. The position of the cupula signals head velocity. 
with a constant velocity rotation, which, which we all commonly use in, in testing, uh, the cupula gradually returns to its initial resting state and the nystagmus fades. A constant acceleration is needed to keep the cupula deviated and hence to produce a sustained slow phase velocity, a constant acceleration. So here's an example of some data uh, from uh, our subject. The subject is, is in, in this case, is in the magnet for almost a half an hour, 24 minutes. This is a little nystagmus trace. Here on the y-axis we have the slow phase velocity. This is time. You can see the nystagmus bump, bumps up and then there's a slow decay which we will show as adaptation. And when the subject comes out of the magnet, we get a reversal phase. This is an after effect, an adaptation after effect. Now, MVS, magnetic vestibular stimulation, produces a force that is an acceleration-like stimulus that pushes the cupula of the semicircular canal to a new position and this produces a sustained slow phase nystagmus response. We took uh, patients uh, without labyrinthine function, we put them in the magnet, put their head in several orientations. These had acquired loss of labyrinthine hypofunction. They had no nystagmus in this paradigm. So we think the labyrinth must be intact to some degree to generate this nystagmus. Now, what's the mechanism? You have to consider how might magnetic fields affect biological tissues, and uh, there are a number of ways that magnetic fields can affect biological tissues. Uh, the bottom line for us, and we're going to come to that, is that it's static, static magnetohydrodynamic forces, or Lorentz forces. I'll explain those in, in a minute. Physics. Where's Herman Kingma? Physics is important. <laughs> And we had a physicist give a talk today already. So, let me just give you the summary of our experiments of how we were able to show what was causing the nystagmus. I won't give you the details. We put people in and out of the magnetic field at different rates. We use different magnetic strengths. We put people in the front of the magnet. We put people in the back of the magnet. We put people head first. We put people foot first. And finally, we could figure out what was causing this. So, it's static. It's continuous. It's not related to transiently induced voltages, that is Faraday forces, not related to that. It was polarity sensitive, reversing the magnetic field vector, reverses the nystagmus direction. Therefore, it wasn't due to magnetic susceptibility properties of tissue. So the answer was static magnetohydrodynamic forces. These are the effects of magnetic fields on fluids in which there is a current flowing. So here's our little uh, tube, and um, we have a current flowing through here. We have a, uh, a magnetic field here, and this is going to produce a force here in this tube. And this is going to become the semicircular canal, and this force is going to push on the cupula. So, these are the three parameters of, of, of entrance, the current direction, the field of the magnetic direction, and then you will get a force in that fluid. So this is called the Lorenz force, he described it. So let me summarize a little bit about what's going on in the inner ear fluids. Endolymph is the key. We have a current in the endolymph fluid, and actually it's primarily for our purposes generated by the current going into the utricle to keep those neurons firing. And then we have a, a force which is generated in the canal to push the cupula to cause the nystagmus. It pushes the cupula to a constant position, the equivalent of a constant acceleration. So endolymph is a potassium-rich fluid that fills the vestibular labyrinth and serves a dual purpose. It transmits ionic current to the hair cells of the utricle to sustain their resting discharge, and it transmits a force as pressure onto the cupula within the semicircular canal. Now, the canal is the conduit that channels the Lorentz force from the interaction between the magnetic fields and the ionic currents in the endolymph. It channels that force onto the cupula. 
Direct excitation of the utricle is not the mechanism. It's the movement of the cupula, as we all know, causes nystagmus. So where is it coming from and what are the directions? So here's our magnetic field vector. It says, remember, the subject is actually lying supine. We've kind of rotated things up. There's our vector. Here's our utricular current. And there's the fluid pressure going right into the lateral canal. The geometry is perfect for this. And it's important to remember the anterior canal is also excited to a certain degree. So here's an example, again, if you could show this video, please, uh, of a recording with a little more sensitivity so we can see the torsion. It's another subject in the magnet, and you can see it's actually a mixed horizontal torsional nystagmus. So this is the pattern in a normal subject. So a little geometric model. Uh, so red is the fluid force, green is the current vector, uh, gold is the, or yellow is the magnetic field, and the flow of uh, fluid is, is sort of orange. And you can see the lateral and anterior canals are the ones that are affected. In each pair, one is excited and the other is inhibited. So, nystagmus, therefore, remember what our fellows showed from the 19th century, Florence, Boyer, etc. The horizontal component will be, obviously, you'll excite one canal and inhibit the other. It's going to be horizontal, slow phase. The torsional component without a vertical component comes out because with the anterior canals, the vertical component com the vertical components cancel and the torsional components add. So that's why you get this funny pattern of nystagmus. And note the torsion or the top pole and the horizontal component beat to opposite ears. This is a very unusual pattern of nystagmus that really can only be explained by our hypothesis about the directions of the current vectors and the forces. So to prove some of this, we put our normal subject in the magnet with different head orientations so we could change the vector uh, of the field versus the current vector in the fluid and change the direction of the nystagmus. We did just that. So with the, um, with the uh, chin way, uh, way up, we get a slow phase to the left in this case. You can see the MHD fluid forces to the left. And then if you move uh, the head in a more neutral position, you can find a place where no nystagmus is, is elicited. And then when you pitch the head way forward, you get the nystagmus in the other direction. It changes direction. Just you, what you would predict from a magnetic field vector interacting with the ionic current vector. So let me summarize this part. Strong magnetic fields interact with weak, naturally occurring ionic currents flowing into vestibular hair cells to produce a constant force in the endolymph fluid. And the force pushes on the cupola just as during a rotation of the head at a constant acceleration. And this causes a constant nystagmus. If fixation is removed, you'll see it. OK, so MVS has joined the pantheon of labyrinthine stimulators. Galvanic, 19th century, Hitzig among other people. Caloric, Barani, 19th century. Rotators, a long time. Uh, many people in the 19th century, but, uh, but Barani also brought that into the clinic. And now we have a, another way to stimulate the labyrinth. And I'll tell you, it's a very practical, useful way to stimulate the labyrinth magnetic field vestibular stimulation. So you can read about this in your spare time. Uh, this was published in a, a, a few papers. Uh, Brian Ward, the first author, and Dale Roberts, the first author. So what is set point adaptation? So let's take this curious phenomenon and take it into physiology, and then we're going to take it to the clinic. So set point adaptation. This is homeostasis, balance. Uh, as I said, Walter Cannon and Claude Bernard brought this to bear. That's how we keep our, um, our satiety, our temperature, et cetera, all under control. And these homeostatic mechanisms are pervasive throughout nature and throughout our bodies. The lowest levels of membrane and motor control, reflex arcs, mechanical cytoskeleton, to the highest levels of cognition and 
an emotional state. We need our equal poise, our emotional equal poise, to respond optimally in our environment to stressful and uncertain environments. Motor control, especially. Um, we need balanced tone, so you all know this from the labyrinth, so our motor systems can work in a push-pull. One excites, the other inhibits. Uh, likewise for not only motor, agonist antagonist, but sensory, as in the labyrinth. Uh, these mechanisms provide for quiet null zones when no movement is needed. This increases your signal to noise ratio, lowers the threshold to detect uh, imposed perturbations. More accurate movements can be made from a stable platform, and they extend the linear, linear range over which perturbations are accurately detected, and the correct compensatory movements are produced. So uh, they provide for compensation on the motor or the sensory side. Take an ocular muscle of palsy. Uh, muscles contract and relax around a certain level of tone. Therefore, you can actually move one eye in one field with just one muscle by making it relax or contract. Um, loss of one labyrinth, obviously. Now you can detect um, direction of head, head rotations in both directions with just one labyrinth, because one side can go up and one side can go down. Pathology can produce abnormal set points and biases. Uh, spontaneous nystagmus, obviously. Skew deviations because of otolith imbalance. Head tremor, wry neck, and cervical dystonia. Static deviation of the eyes, uh, ipsy pulsion toward the lesion side under closed lids, and Wallenberg syndrome, brainstem infarction. Rebound nystagmus and cerebellar disease. I can go on and on and talk about all this pathology which really reflects set point problems. Now, I want to show you two more quick videos. I picked Wallenberg syndrome because they are, are, are typical for set point problems and also because the most beautiful descriptions of these disorders were done in the 1960s by Swedish neurologists and ophthalmologists. So uh, let's see this, please. This is Wallenberg syndrome, infarction in pica. This is uh, alternate cover test. This is a skew deviation, part of the ocular tilt reaction. It's a static imbalance in otolith ocular function. Let's go to the next one. Here's another example of a set point problem. This is a steady state eye position. The patient closed their eyes and the eyes deviate over to one side. Straight ahead, has, the set point for straight ahead has been deviated. Okay, so let's finish up by talking about how we're gonna use MBS to study set point adaptation. Again, what are the early lines of defense? And what are their limitations against an unwanted spontaneous nystagmus, such as occurs when we lose function on one side, vestibular neuritis, vestibular nerve section? So we have visual fixation mechanisms. I mentioned those. They can help suppress the nystagmus. The Romberg sign, they act within seconds. But they're not perfect, limited velocity range. Not good for high velocities of spontaneous nystagmus. Not so good for vertical nystagmus. And the visual tracking mechanisms then become saturated and you can't track things as well. Now we have short-term vestibular adaptation. You probably all know about this. Usually within a minute or so. These are the reversal phases of rotational, caloric, head-shaking nystagmus. They're incomplete and they're temporary. Now you can disengage the neural integrators, the eye position integrators, if you will. Uh, you can create a null position. This is Alexander's law. That occurs within seconds, but it only gives you one eye orbital position where you have no nystagmus. Not very useful long term. You can get rid of the velocity storage mechanism, you know, that accumulates activity when we rotate for a while at constant speed. That doesn't rebalance the vestibular nuclei. That is not a permanent solution. We have a depression of spontaneous nystagmus activity of the vestibular nuclei on the intact side. This has been called the cerebellar clamp. But if you do that, you're impairing function for rotation toward the good side. You're limiting that. So none of these solutions, and we know this, are not perfect. We need long-term adaptation mechanisms. 
So here's some classical work from Jeffrey Melville Jones, Malcolm, uh, Larry Young, and Chuck Ullman. They rotated the subject here at a constant speed. This is eye velocity, this is time, and you can see if you keep rotating, the eye actually goes over in the other direction for a little bit. This is called the reversal phase, that's adaptation. You do acceleration, constant acceleration, you see the same, the same kind of adaptation. This is nice, but it only gives you information about the first four or five minutes of adaptation. They develop these ideas, that these are so-called, these little circuits are adaptation operators, the brain takes a signal and tries to rebalance things, and there are different ways to do this. These are very nice. There's only one time constant, one short period that they could account for, and again, just, just minutes. So what did we do? Uh, excuse me, these, these are, are some nice simulations. These are models of this short-term adaptation, which they did uh, by using one adaptation operator, if you will. So we had the advantage that we could look at a subject with nystagmus for an hour or two. Here's an example of a subject who was in the scanner, just lying there, it's quite peaceful, uh, oops, for uh, 7,000 seconds, you know, this is uh, 90 minutes. Here's the uh, nystagmus when they go in the scanner. There is some quick adaptation, and then it slowly persists, but there is a slight Another decay here when they come out, there's a big after effect. What did we do? Well, not brilliant, but we just said, well, maybe there are three of these adaptation networks, each with slightly different dynamics. So we added, added three, a, a slow one, a medium one, and a fast one. And when we did that, we took our subject's data and we were able to fit it almost perfectly, assuming that the brain had a, a quick adaptation for getting fast, a medium adaptation for getting less fast, and then a longer adaptation, holding on to the adaptation much better. So uh, this is a nice uh, oops, simulation of this. Um, to summarize this, we have adaptation circuits modeled as variable leaky integrators, multiple adaptation circuits. Some had slower acquisition, but better retention. We found three rates at which the brain adapts to this very acute vestibular imbalance with time course of seconds, minutes, and hours, and the longer time courses have slower acquisition, but better, better retention. And we reported this uh, a couple years ago. So, so what? Does this generalize? Does this mean anything? Well, we went back and we found that Jeffrey Melville Jones uh, and his colleagues had studied a somewhat different form of adaptation. He called it uh, protokinetic adaptation. Subjects would stand, a uh, walk in place. Uh, underneath them, there would be a revolving disc, and they would gradually adapt to this disc. And uh, after, when they stopped the disc, they would march in the other direction, sort of a, a Cruda stepping test, if you will, and uh, the time course was almost exactly the same. 15 seconds, 300 seconds, and a few hours. So we suggest, hypothesis, that there is perhaps a common mechanism in which similar processes, similar time courses that underlie set point adaptation in many motor systems. So this is my, this red thing. <coughs> That's my emergency ending thing there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, here are the conclusions. Um, vestibular set point, or bias adaptation, rebalances the vestibular nuclei, multiple time courses, eliminates unwanted spontaneous nystagmus. We use MVS, the ideal tool to experimentally look at this problem. If you want to produce a nystagmus for a few hours, you don't want to do calorics, you don't want to spin someone at constant acceleration, and you don't want galvanic stimulation. This is a nice way to do it, and we were able to dissect out the first three time courses of adaptation, seconds, minutes, and a few hours. And again, each adaptive stage is characterized by progressively increasing time for acquisition, but increasing time of retention. Slower but more durable learning. And we suggest that MVS induced set point adaptation could be a model to study adaptation in many other motor systems 
and potential uses for diagnosis and treatment. So, we're going to finish with two thoughts. Um, think set point adaptation in the clinic. There are many examples of this in, uh, in vector S phenomena, recovery nystagmus, hyperventilation affecting demyelinated fibers, Meniere syndrome, cerebellar central lesions. And the second message is we have so many young people in this audience, and it is your <clears throat> your charge to develop the molecular biological tools to learn how these three different time courses of adaptation are occurring, how the longer time course is occurring that eventually completely rebalances the vestibular nuclei, and in that way we may be able, be, we may be able to uh, use these mechanisms to make our patients recover more quickly. Thank you. Good winner this year. Thank you. <laughs>